Hey there, good morning, and welcome to Compass Christian Church. Uh, my name is Amanda, and I'm going to be your host for the service today. We're going to get things started in just a minute with the band coming up to lead us in a few songs of worship. Um, the lyrics will be on the screen, and we would love for you to sing along and join us in worship however you feel comfortable.
Well, good morning. It's good to finally be here with our weekly services. Welcome to Compass. And uh, again, before we go too far, I want to thank you for coming. And those of you online, either live or in the future, we appreciate your time as well. Uh, we've got several friends I know who are watching. We've got Paula, our worship pastor, who's not here today because she's not feeling well. So uh, our prayers are with her family. Uh, our motto, I want to start here with a brief introduction about Compass, who we are, what we're trying to accomplish. Our motto here is following Jesus together. Oh, we forgot announcements. We'll do the announcements at the end. Yep. Um, while there are certain things that our leadership team agrees on doctrinally, uh, we want to be clear that we enjoy different perspectives. Uh, so there are no questions that are off limits. Uh, we want to be a safe space for inquiry and for discussion. Uh, we can come together and follow Jesus, living our faith out practically, without agreeing on every little detail of doctrine. And so I think that's all really important to keep in mind as we head into this series on the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is such a big idea, it's such a broad concept, uh, that it's going to be hard for me to do it justice. I'm just going to be honest with you. I think we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about it. But it's such a big deal, it's such a big thing, um, that it's going to be hard for me to put words around it at times. And so there are going to be some ways I'm going to use to describe it that you're going to probably like. There are going to be things like, oh yeah, I agree with that, that makes sense to me, and you'll nod along. And there will be things that you'll be like, huh, I'm not sure about that, I don't know if that's how I would you know, say that or whatever. And there might be some things that you disagree with. And uh, when these things happen, I think it's important to remember the advice we were given as kids by our moms. If you don't have something nice to say, just don't say it, right? <laughs> no, that's not what I'm saying. I, uh, I'd love to hear all of it. I'd love to hear all of it. If you uh, have things you disagree with me about, if you have things you have questions about, um, we would love to hear about it. Um, so that's totally fine. So this morning, we're focusing on the question, what is the gospel? And when we do, uh, when we talk about the kingdom of God, when I think about the kingdom of God, what I think about is God's overarching plan of redemption. And so when we think about this, um, I think that there's a mind picture that can be very helpful, and that is of uh, a forest. So you can think about all the little details in the Bible, all the little details, all the different stories, the narratives, um, all the different things that we've read throughout our whole lives. Those are like uh, branches or, or uh, sticks or leaves or whatever. Uh, they're very minute details. And the kingdom of God is more like looking at a forest from like a drone kind of level. You're above the forest. You're looking at the whole thing and you're seeing how the whole Bible functions together. Um, so it's about God's big plan of redemption. What is God's goal that he has in mind? How is he working and how has he worked through Jesus to bring that? And the whole forest, the grand story that the Bible tells us, it's one of a God who loves us, who wants a relationship with us, and who acted to, in love to redeem us when we were lost. And of course, that story centers around a Jewish man named Jesus who lived 2,000 years ago. So that is that's sort of the grand view of things. And if we think about other stories that we've come across, that makes sense to us, right? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a nerd. I'm going to out myself a little bit as a nerd here. When we think about Star Wars, for example, what is Star Wars about? I mean, you've got all these different scenes, all these different things that happen. You have like two Death Stars that explode in the first, you know, four, five, and six, right? But the whole thing is about the Skywalker family and how they impacted the course of history. That's, that's the grand narrative that Star Wars is trying to tell from beginning to end. Um, and you can think about other stories that, that you've interacted with, uh, that you've engaged with. Uh, there are these little details that come into play, but then there's the grand narrative, what ties it all together. And that whole thing that ties the whole Bible together, that big theme of the whole Bible is the kingdom of God. And that's what we're going to explore in this series as we move forward. So I, don't, I know that we're starting a new series, and some of this will be new. Uh, for some of us, and it will be surprising maybe for some of us, and maybe th some of the things I talk about today will be new or, or surprising. So I wanted to give you something to hang your hat on or your coat on, some, something to give you an idea of where we're going and what we're going to see. So there's, there's three patterns I wanted to sort of point out in this initial sermon. And the first one is what God wanted in the beginning, he's going to get in the end. 
Um, and I think that's an important thing for us to, to know and to consider and to think about. Uh, but this also implies that God has a goal in mind, and understanding this goal may help us answer other difficult questions like, why doesn't God deal with evil now the way that we would maybe want him to, or things like that. So that will be one thing that we can consider. Uh, the second thing that we're going to think, talk about, although I don't know if we're going to talk about it too much today, we might touch on it briefly, is uh, God has taught uh, throughout time principles of selfless sacrifice and upside-down leadership uh, with the intent for us to follow that example. So I think when we think about human history, uh, many of the great calamities that happen in the Bible and even to modern times happen because people have rejected God's original intent for leadership. And then the third thing is that the great, you think about the greatest desires of our heart, and I'm not talking about, uh, you know, maybe something that we th think about, hey, I sort of like this football team to win or something like that. I'm talking about the greatest desires of our heart. At the end of the day, what, if we could wish for one thing, what would it be? I think a lot of us are selfless enough to be like, justice or world peace or prosperity for everyone, food for everyone, uh, these kinds of deepest desires of our heart, the things that we are encoded with, the things that almost all humans agree that like this is our most basic uh, desire, um, those things are going to be promised by God and they're going to be fulfilled uh, in the kingdom of God. And what's interesting about all those things, the deepest desires of our heart, this, I, this perfect justice, um, peace, prosperity, those types of things, these things cannot be promised by the world. So when we think about the gospel message up against what the world can offer us, there's really no comparison. What God can offer is so much greater. So we're going to begin by considering the question, what is the gospel? And I want you to take about 10 or 15 seconds and just think about if you came across someone on the street and they asked you, so what is this gospel that you Christians are talking about? What would you say to them? I'm going to give you 10 or 15 seconds. So when I've asked people this question, a lot of times I get uh, the death of Jesus on the cross. I get like the resurrection or the ascension of Jesus. Or sometimes people add that Jesus is coming back someday. Okay, and those are all true. Those are all elements of the gospel. Uh, what we're going to see this morning is that those elements are surprising in the sense that Jesus actually really didn't teach those things. And he, it talks, the Bible talks about him going around preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. But he doesn't really go around talking about his death and resurrection a lot, especially not publicly. He tells his disciples, uh, the Pharisees eventually catch wind of it toward the end of his life, but it's not one of Jesus' big public teachings. Uh, the kingdom of God is. So we're going we're to go into that a little bit. Now some people may add that the gospel or the, or the good news, because that's what gospel means, it just means good news, is that we will live forever in heaven. Now, we're going to look at that specifically this morning, and the answer may surprise you. And again, we do this, I do this teaching in, in humility and with grace, uh, knowing that I could definitely be wrong. But we're going to explore in the next three or so weeks um, all the evidence that I think leads me to thinking that there might be something to think about with heaven. So we're going to open Mark 1. If you have your Bible, you can turn there in Mark 1. And we're going to be talking about the gospel that Jesus preached in Mark chapter 1, this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And John the Baptist had been going around and telling people to repent and to, to believe the gospel of the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And then Jesus comes on the scene, and in Mark chapter 1, verse 14, it says, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand repent and believe in the gospel. So from the beginning of his ministry, Jesus was preaching this thing that's called the gospel of God, and it's also called the gospel of the kingdom here in this passage. Um, now when you think about, uh, you can turn with me to Luke 4. When, when you think about Jesus' mission statement from our perspective after the cross, 
you might think like Jesus' mission statement would be, I came here to die for your sins and to be raised again the third day and then to, you know, to eventually be ascended to the right hand of, of the throne of God. But that's not actually his public-facing mission statement. And Luke, in Luke chapter 4, tells us his public-facing mission statement. This is what he told uh, the people that he was preaching to what his mission was. And in Luke chapter 4, verse 42 He's just done a ton of miracles in this area, and they want him to stay, obviously. They want his power to stay and for him to continue blessing them. And it says, And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place, and the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. So the reason that Jesus gives, his mission statement, the reason that he came and ministered to people was to preach this gospel of the kingdom of God. That's what he came to do. That's his outward-facing mission statement. Let's turn to Luke chapter 9, just a couple pages over. There's also a contrast here between the gospel of the kingdom and these truths that we generally consider to be the gospel, which is the death and the resurrection. And that is that one of them, the disciples, believed in and latched onto immediately and taught themselves, and the other one, they didn't. And we're going to see that contrast here in Luke chapter 9. In Luke chapter 9, it says, And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. So when Jesus called the 12 disciples, he gave them power and he sent them out to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. And later in Luke 10, when he sends out the 70 or the 72, depending on your translation, they were also sent out with power and to preach the kingdom of God. So to this point, you think about this. The disciples had heard Jesus preach the gospel of the kingdom of God for months and months and months. They finally get called out for a specific purpose to be sent out and to preach that same message. So they heard that message. They believed that message. They repented. And then they actually taught that message. So I want you to contrast that with how the disciples respond to what we generally consider the gospel message. If you turn with me to Matthew Matthew chapter 16, there is a big contrast here between what they heard as the gospel and then what we generally conceive of as the gospel. In Matthew chapter 16, and this is also recorded in a couple different places in Luke 9, so it's around the same time, it's after he sent out the 12, but before he sends out the 70, according to Luke's chronology. But in Matthew chapter 16, it's a little bit more dramatic. Uh, Verse 21, it says, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. So that is what we would generally consider to be the gospel message that we've heard and believed. But what it says here in verse 22, this is how Peter responds to this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. That is the gospel message that most of us, when we think of what is the gospel, that is the gospel. And does Peter believe it? No, he rejects it. So, and it's true that throughout the rest of his ministry, his disciples never really warmed up to this idea that Jesus was going to leave them, that he was going to die, and that he was going to be raised again, and then he was going to leave them and ascend. Um, He spends a lot of time in John teaching this in his last uh, private teaching with them, and they still don't really like that idea. So it takes them some time to warm up to all of that. But the gospel of the kingdom of God, what Jesus had been preaching throughout all the synagogues, that was something that they latched onto and were excited about and believed and preached. So there is a complete difference there. Let's turn to Acts chapter 8. So 
after Jesus dies and he's resurrected and he comes back and he appears to his apostles and he, he appears to some of the other disciples and the day of Pentecost comes, all sorts of things happen. And what we notice uh, during the time of Acts is that uh, they're still proclaiming the kingdom of God message that Jesus and John the Baptist originally preached. That's still the message that they're preaching. But there's something that gets added to it. There's something that gets added to it, and that is what we generally conceive of as the gospel. And in Acts chapter 8, there's a great example of this. In verse 12, it says, But when they believed Philip, as he preached good news about what? The kingdom of God, and, now notice, he's adding something here, and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So I have it color, sort of color-coded up here on the slide for us. Philip was preaching the kingdom of God. That was the same message that John the Baptist proclaimed. That was the same message that Jesus proclaimed. This is the same message that the initial disciples heard and they believed and they latched onto and they repented and they decided to get on board with it and they followed Jesus and eventually they get commissioned out to preach that portion of it. So that's the part of the gospel that they agreed with, believed during his earthly ministry. The second part, the part that we all conceive of as the gospel, is the part that they rejected and didn't believe and didn't want to accept until after it was already passed. But once it's passed, once they get through, um, I mean, I'm sure it was terrible to watch their master die and then to wait for him to be raised from the dead and then to see him appear to them, then that would have been very exciting, of course, but... But that piece of it was something that they didn't latch on to and agree with and believe and repent of what they didn't believe before until after it had already taken place. And I think it's, care- it's important for us that we're not like lofty and like, oh, well, I would have believed it, right? <laughs> because these were pretty smart guys. They were around Jesus. Um, so I'm not saying this in a haughty way. Hey, look, they didn't believe this, you know. I'm just pointing out that what we generally conceive of as the gospel is the piece that came, that was preached later, that was public later. That piece wasn't super public during Jesus' ministry. Let's go to Acts chapter 28. We're going to see that Paul, and again, Paul, it mentions throughout the book of Acts, Paul does the same thing. He preaches the gospel of the kingdom of God. Uh, It defines the gospel of grace at one point as the gospel of the kingdom in the book of Acts. Um, but I want to skip ahead to the end because these are sort of the easiest verses to, to do this justice and do it, do it briefly. In Acts 28, verse 23, it says, When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. So again, you have those two distinct things going on. At the end, in verse 30, it says, He, Paul, lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So again, Paul preached the same kingdom of God message. John the Baptist preached, Jesus preached, and eventually the disciples got on board with it after the events uh, of the death and resurrection. So the gospel gets completed in some sense uh, when people start believing in the death and resurrection of Jesus, and that happens after his death and his resurrection. So you've got the kingdom of God peace that carries all the way through, and then you've got this things about Jesus Christ, his life, his death, what he did, uh, what that accomplished for us. That piece, that piece that's so more, much more familiar to us is the piece that came later, that was believed later. So as you can already tell, the series is not called um, <laughs> uh, The Death and Resurrection of Jesus. <laughs> We're not going to focus on the second part of the gospel. The second part of the gospel we will talk about when we get to Easter, and it's the part that we're more comfortable with, I think, generally, as a general rule. So what I'm going to focus on in this whole sermon series is what is this gospel of the kingdom of God? Because I think for me growing up, even though I grew up in a church, it was a very nebulous kind of a thing. And so what we want to do is sort of put something definite onto that. So if you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to try to briefly do this today. And we're, like I said, it's going to take us a long time to develop all the different things. And the kingdom is such a huge idea. So in Matthew chapter 6, 
when we think about what was Jesus preaching, what was his kingdom message, um, in the middle of the Lord's Prayer, at the beginning of it actually, it says in Matthew 6, 9, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So is God's will being done right now on earth like it is being done in heaven? No. So in its fullest sense, the kingdom of God is a place and a time, you could think of it as both, uh, when that is true, when God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. So there are sort of multiple things going on here, and I think part of the confusion is uh, the use of the word kingdom, the, and we're going to talk about the word kingdom um, a little bit more next week. Uh, but, but the kingdom of God, when we think about kingdom, uh, we generally think of like a place. Like we think of the kingdom, the United Kingdom, like the UK, or we think of uh, some of the, the kingdoms that existed in the past, like um, you know, different empires, like the Roman Empire. Those are kingdoms, and those we generally confine to a time and a place. Um, but we usually think of it as the location itself, like the barriers, the land mass, those types of things. The kingdom of God is the reign and rule of God. And when we think about it from an English perspective, the first thing we think about is the place. And in the Hebrew and in the Greek, uh, it actually refers primarily to uh, the reign and rule of a king, not to the place. Now, they're interconnected ideas, and so this is sort of subtle, uh, but this is a quote I really enjoyed from the Bible Project on this. It says, The English word kingdom, if you look in the dictionary, primarily refers to a place. In the Hebrew and Greek words, the Greek basileia and the Hebrew malkut, refers to an activity, an action. The biblical term primarily refers to an action that includes a place. It refers to an action, the rule and the reign of a king over his people, which is going to be somewhere. So even the Bible Project guys, Tim Mackey, is having trouble putting all this into words precisely, and that's what, uh, why the kingdom can be so difficult. Uh, so, so in its fullest expression, it's when God's will is being done on earth as it is in heaven. That's going to happen when Jesus Christ comes back. Um, but in, in, a, in a lesser sense, or in an anticipatory sense, we can experience small aspects of the kingdom now. And we're going to talk about that as well, through the reign and the rule of God in our lives and in the lives of those around us. So with that in mind, thinking about what the Bible Project says, and, and, and again, there are, there are a number of scholars who are, who are coming around and warming up to the kingdom of God being on a restored earth. And we're going to talk about all the reasons I think that that's true in two weeks. So I hope you hold up to our three-week challenge, because I'll get there by the end of the three weeks, I promise, but we're not going to get all of it today. I want to humbly return to the subject of heaven. I know that there are a couple verses in the Bible that seem to support the traditional view of heaven, and we don't have time today to discuss them. We're going to discuss them in a couple weeks. Um, but there are many, many sections of the Bible that talk about the eternal kingdom and how it will be on a restored earth. If you turn with me to Revelation the last book. And again, we're thinking about the Bible as um, a grand narrative of God's plan of how he's going to redeem humanity. And when we think about that, it's fascinating that the same pictures that we get at the end of the Bible are the pictures that we have at the beginning of the Bible. And I just want to show this to you now at, at the end here, and then we'll go back to the beginning. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice coming from the throne, saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. So the new Jerusalem, this new heavenly city, the city that Hebrews says Abraham was looking for, whose builder and maker is God, that city comes down from heaven, and it comes down where? 
to earth. It comes down to earth. And look at this. The picture here is God wiping away every tear from, from their eyes. There's, there's a couple different prophecies in here, which we'll maybe unpack in a later sermon. But the idea is that there's no more death. There's no more suffering. We have peace. We have justice. We have all the things that our heart yearns for in this moment. So with this in mind, um, another scholar that, that sees the future of the kingdom of God, the gospel of the kingdom of God, as a restored earth rather than heaven perpetually is N.T. Wright, the Anglican uh, former bishop and uh, pastor and scholar. And he says in a sermon from 2007, the Bible doesn't speak as so many Christians imagine of a disembodied heaven, but rather of new heavens and new earth. And the point about God's future world is that it will be more real, more solid, more tangible and visible and tasteable than the present world. And that, for a good reason, the present world is full of corruption and decay, of violence and sorrow and sin and death. But the whole point is that what God has decided to do about all this, precisely because he's the creator who loves the world he made, is to do away with all that corruption and sorrow and death, and so leave the way clear for the world to be renewed from top to bottom, so that everything that's pure and lovely and beautiful and noble and wise will shine out all the more brightly. I thought that was a beautiful description of the kingdom of God in its fullness when Jesus comes back and the world is made new. Uh, let's go back to the beginning of your Bibles. You can hold, if you want to, your finger in Revelation. Uh, we'll be back briefly at the end. We're going to go back to Genesis chapter 1. And again, we're going to unpack all these themes. We're going to take plenty of time to do it. I'm doing it briefly today because you have to start somewhere. And I don't want to keep you here for two hours talking about all this stuff. So we'll, we'll take it, our time with it. We'll go through it. But I just want to point out Genesis chapter 1, the story of creation. God has done a number of things. At the end of every day, he says, he says they saw that they were good. And in verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So having dominion here, that word is a related word to our, the word kingdom. So this initial task is a royal task. From the beginning, humans were called to rule over God's good creation. Uh, the Bible Project says God's plan was to share his world with humans and to have his reign and his rule brought about in the world through human beings. God reigns the world through humans. So the picture here in Genesis is of a perfect world being ruled by God through humans. And God wanted these initial humans to exert servant leadership and cultivate the earth, not abuse the environment, uh, but cultivating it, helping it to succeed at a higher level than what's possible with uncultivated things. Uh, in the Bible Project, they talk about how if you let nature go, nature will grow. Nature will do things. Forests will grow. Uh, animals will live. Uh, some of them will even thrive to a certain degree if they just are left alone. But think about someone who has a garden, like Jason, who does our tech stuff. He's doing our slides. Jason has a big garden that he's plant planting. Do you think tomatoes are going to grow better in the wild? Or do you think they're going to grow better with someone like Jason cultivating them, taking care of them, serving them, providing for them? That's the picture we have here in Genesis 1. That is the role for humanity. It is ruling, it is dominion through service. I also think another great example is our, our good friend Jerry here with his dogs. Man, if you want to see well-trained dogs, just go to Jerry's house and watch them do their thing or follow him on Facebook. Or, are you on Instagram too, Jerry? No, you're not on Instagram. All right, just Facebook then. Just go and check that out. You're on TikTok though, right? Oh, you stop TikTok. All right. All right. Well, just follow him on Facebook if you want to know more about dog training. The point I'm trying to make is that the dogs that Jerry has are wonderful animals, and they are very smart. But if you talk to him, left to their own devices, they're not going to reach their potential. What he can do with those dogs, helping them to train them and, and those types of things, helps them reach a level that they're not able to reach without that. That's not that's dominion in some sense, but it's servant leadership. It is helping them bring out the fullness in them. And that is what our, our 
mission was from God in the very beginning. So that is what God wanted. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 22. Again, back at the end of the Bible. And this is where we'll close. Revelation chapter 22. So the picture from Genesis is a perfect world being reigned by God, mediated by people serving the animals and the plants and cultivating them, helping them to reach their full potential. In Revelation chapter 22, we've already seen that the, the heavenly Jerusalem comes down and the earth gets restored. And then verse 20, chapter 22, verse 1, it says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, that leaves on the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. So there we are, where his servants were worshiping them. Verse 4, they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light. Now notice this last phrase. It sort of gets dropped in here like a, an aside. And they will what? Reign forever and ever. He's talking about the servants still. The servants are going to reign alongside our God and the Lamb. So the picture here is of God picking up where he left off in Eden with a few differences. But notice again that humans are the one ruling through service. So just to conclude this, wrap this up in a little bow for today. The high perspective, high level perspective of God's redemptive plan is this. He wanted humans to rule the world through service, justice, and love. And as we'll see next week, we talked about the good news today of the gospel. We're going to talk about the bad news next week. There's always good news and bad news, right? As we'll see next week, the original humans decided that they were better than God, and so they refused his reign, and that made the world a much worse place and sadder place than what God originally intended. But there is good news. God has acted through his son Jesus, and the debt of our sin has been paid, and we will have the opportunity to reign in the future, in the kingdom of God. So the picture that we get and where N.T. Wright and others have helped us today is that God, when, when humanity fell, God didn't si decide to scrap humanity. He didn't decide that his experiment with humanity was done and he was just going to move on to something else. He decided to redeem humanity. And the gospel of the kingdom of God is that similarly, God is not going to give up on this earth. He is going to redeem this earth. So, is life fair? No. There's inequality and injustice all around us. We yearn for justice. We yearn for peace. But did you know that the deepest desires of our heart, the things that we really crave and value in life, those are the things that God has promised and he's promised them in the kingdom of God. And someday God will bring his kingdom to earth in the fullest sense through his son Jesus returning. Until then, our goal is to seek first the kingdom of God, like Jesus says in Matthew. We're going to seek that kingdom first. the waves if they are still that dimension of his name and they'll say God is still the same and ask the walls if they still fall at the mighty sound of praise and they'll say God is still the same that's right when did he break his promise when did
If it is strong enough to keep hope in its chains, I'll say, God is still the same, oh yeah. When did he break his promise? When did his kindness fail? Never has, never will, my God is still the same. When did he lose his power? When did his mercy change? Never has, never will, my God is still the same. Not once did he ever stop moving. Not once has he ever let go. Did he ever stop proving our God is in control? Not once did he ever stop moving. Not once has he ever let go. Not once did he ever stop proving our God is in control. When did he break his promise? When did his kindness fail? Never has, never will. My God. people for coming today. We're glad that you're here. Amanda, go ahead. Head out. Uh, just two more quick announcements. One, we would love for you to stick around with us for our 10-minute coffee party. Um, grab one more cup of coffee, or if you're too caffeinated, grab a snack and some water, and <laughs> stick around for a chat. Pastor Will will be around. The worship team will be around. Um, come say hi to us. If you have kids in Kids Church right now, or I think there's no nursery today, right? Just Kids Church. You can pick them up just down the hall. Um, right down by the big doors where you entered. Um, and finally, thanks for coming. May the Lord bless you and keep you, and may he fake it, make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thanks so much.